Hi, welcome back. This is Scott Pekarik with Verde Property Management here today with Matt Engel with the Engel Law Firm. Correct. And we're here in our three-part seminar on the eviction process. Uh, part two. Part two is the eviction hearing. Uh, if you joined us before, we were talking about the pre-eviction process with a lot of great, great information. Thank you, Matt. Uh, so as we move into the actual eviction hearing, um, Matt, can you just kind of describe that process a little bit? Like we've we've served the tenants, their eviction summons, you have all your required paperwork. Right. What happens next? So you know, there's the day of the eviction hearing. So again, at this point, uh, we file the complaint, all the proper information is there. You got your rental license. I've done all the background work and now we're there. Uh, generally speaking, the, the courts and the judges, uh, they don't want to be kicking out everyone that comes in there. They want they want solutions. They want they don't want more problems, right? So they really push us. Pretty much every judge says it's my order at this time that if both parties are here, you go out in the hallway and engage in some sort of settlement discussion, a talk. What's going on? What are your gripes? Uh, and can you find a solution? Uh, pretty much every county uh, has uh, uh, volunteer mediators now. So you go to housing court and there's three mediators sitting there. They're used more for people who uh, either are uh, mom and pop who've brought their own eviction and they don't know how to solve an eviction problem or how to write up a settlement agreement, um, but they have mediators available. They have all kinds of resources available at all the courts now uh, for the tenants when they come in, including uh, most of the time they have free legal aid attorneys and everything. Uh, so again, you go to the, the, the hearing date on the summons is what's called the initial hearing. So the initial hearing for an eviction is kind of like what we would call an arraignment in a criminal matter. It's the first hearing where you either say guilty or not guilty. So if you are a tenant, you could go to court and say, yep, I missed my rent payment, in which case you could try to do a payment plan or pay at court, or um, you could argue about it, in which it would be contested. Again, so during that process, we're trying to find what's a solution, how can we figure this out uh, as part of the process. Well, and I think as a practical matter, you know, from a property manager slash investor's point of view, you know, we want, you know, our, our goal is not to throw people on the street. Our goal is to receive the rent that we were, that we agreed would be paid for right. the housing that we agreed would be provided. Correct. And this is just, I always look at the eviction as our, our last tool in order to, to maintain that relationship and get the, you know, whether I own the property or it's some property that we represent an owner on to get paid. Right, and so when you say the last tool, what makes it the best last tool is that there's teeth behind it, right? So the example is, is again, every county has a settlement agreement form, and it has a box, a chart, that says go out in the hallway, and if you're okay with the tenant getting caught up, getting back on track, which, again, most landlords want. They don't want to have to pay to do a turn and get someone out and do that. They'd rather just get paid. Right. So if you can give the tenant a couple extra weeks or some other deals, or if they say, you know what, I get paid every two weeks, and I could make three payments. And if it's reasonable, you know, it's, it pays to be flexible to allow them to get caught up and make a payment plan. Now, when I say why that's the best tool is because the teeth behind it. The difference between you doing an outside of court payment plan and me doing a payment plan at court is that if the tenant doesn't make a payment under my plan that's was approved by a judge, I can go back to court and file what's called an affidavit of violation. Scott didn't make his $1,000 payment due on January 8th. And the court will then order that, the, that I get what's called a writ of recovery, which we'll talk about more in our post-eviction talk. But in essence, if someone violates their payment agreement, the, the serious repercussion is that the sheriff is coming to tell them it's time to go. Where you don't, ha you don't have the ability to get a writ just by doing a, uh, an off-the-record payment agreement, if you will. Okay, so... Uh what happens if, well, let's say someone shows up. Okay, what, what is uh, the process? I'm Scott, the tenant who didn't pay, yeah. and I'm not answering my phone, but I show up to court. What, yeah. what, what usually happens? What's so that? you show up to court, and everyone checks in so the, co the court clerk knows who's here. So, again, then they'll say go out in the hallway and talk. I go out with, with, with Scott, and I say, Scott, you know, this is the complaint. This is what it says you owe. Um, what do you propose? What do you want to try to do here? And if they really don't know, I say, okay, well, here are some basic options. Uh, in a non-payment of rent case, remember we talked about the three basic evictions are number one, non-payment, yep. number two, breach of lease, 
and number three holdover. The, these payment plans, these agreements we're talking about, are primarily for non-payment cases, right? right. Because the, the tenant wants to stay. If it's a breach of, breach of lease for drug use, there's going to be no payment plan or anything. It's going to be how soon are you leaving uh, and that sort of thing. Same thing with holdover. If you've already given them notice to vacate, we're not going to strike a deal for them to stay longer. Right. Anyway, so you look at this payment agreement with this tenant and say, what do you propose? What do you want to try to do? Um, so again, that's if they show up and want to do that. When a tenant shows, if they don't show up, that's what's called a default. Uh, if, if one party doesn't show, it's a default. And then I would get a court order in favor of the plaintiff, the owner landlord, that says I have a right to get the writ of recovery uh, upon payment of the fee and request of the court. But the tenant shows up at the initial hearing, and it's either you admit you owe the rent or you deny you owe the rent. If they admit they owe the rent, I try to work on a plan to get them caught up so, so that the landlord has a, the most cost-effective and efficient solution, which is getting paid and getting paid in a, a you know by money orders or certified checks in the most expeditious manner. And usually the tenant will be represented by legal aid or sometimes most represent of the this. time. I mean Hennepin and Ramsey they have full time. Every time you go to court, there's a, a whole slew of attorneys there who are waiting to represent them. They still have to fill out an application. They still have to qualify based on income limits, okay. but most of them get it. So they, they'll talk to legal aid, and a legal aid will go through their, their list of questions of potential defenses. Are there any problems at the property? Do you have mice? Are there heat problems? Are there blah, blah, blah? Um, do they have a rental license? So legal aid will jump online and look if you got your rental license. So again, part of the, the initial hearing is, are you going to settle it, pay and stay, or is it going to be contested? in which case you'd have to have a trial at a later date to basically go through those issues. Yeah, let's talk about the contested because I think the other, you know, if they don't show up straightforward. Yep. If you if they show up, you mediate whether they're represented or not, some kind of agreement, in Correct. which case then you're just going to, you know, pray that they pay mm -hmm. when they say they're going to. But what if they contest it? You said there'll be a, a trial, like, like say you mentioned mice. So if I say I have mice in the property mm -hmm. and the landlord has actively, I, I know I said use a scenario, this, this is one I'm pulling out of the air, but say the landlord's treating the place for mice, um, is that a, have you seen that be a valid defense to not pay rent? And if it is, what what's that process look right, like? Right, it, it can be. And so uh, in Minnesota, you can show up to a non-payment of rent case and raise what they call a Fritz defense. The reason they were, use the word Fritz is because there's a court of appeals case called Fritz v. Warthen, which basically said uh, the landlord under 504B-161 has to maintain what's called the covenants of habitability, which means it's got to be fit for its purpose. It's got to be in reasonable repair. Well, they allow a tenant to show up at the eviction hearing and say, uh, and Scott could say, this property wasn't in reasonable repair, therefore it wasn't worth $1,000 a month. I should get a $500 a month reduction, therefore I don't owe two grand. I only owe 500 I only owe 1000 Or most of them, they just say, I don't owe any rent because it's infested, right? They saw one mouse, and of course, to everyone, one that's mouse is an infestation. Is an infestation yeah. and, you know, and so that's always the claim. Right. So when you talk about what did the landlord do, what's reasonable, that's where the judge comes in. Um, the judge will look at, well, when did you tell him about the mice? How did you tell him about the mice? Now, the statute talks about written notice, right? Um, but the, that's really been expanded to text messaging, emails, everything else is considered written notice nowadays. So the judge will look at it. Did, did Scott give notice of that? And if he did and the landlord didn't do anything about it or didn't act reasonably, the judge has the ability to abate or reduce the amount of rent based on what they see as a loss of use and enjoyment in the property. So when that happens, that's why the tenants do that. The key to the Fritz defense, though, is the court added language that said, if a tenant shows up, if Scott shows up and says, Matt, I'm contesting this because of, of an infestation of mice, right? Uh, and you're two months behind on rent, two grand. The court will say, well, then you're going to have to take that two grand and escrow it, deposit it with the court before trial. And if you don't put your two grand into court, then you're not going to get your trial. That's how they kind of stop tenants. Otherwise, every tenant would just claim a conditions defense, a Fritz defense, that some sh something was wrong with the property right. and that yeah. therefore they shouldn't have to pay rent. So the statute says you got to post rent if you're going to raise a Fritz defense. And that's just one sample of a defense or a contested case. Do you see that a lot or percentage of cases? Is it? Uh, we do see it a lot. Um, but most of the time when I sit down and someone starts going down that road, I say, 
okay, show me where you told the landlord about this. Do you have the text string? Do you have the emails? Did they know about it? And then I'll say, okay, that's fine if you want to do that and go to trial, but know that the judge is going to make you post your back rent with the court. Now, some of them are confident that they can come up with the money, or maybe they do have the money, but I would say over half the time they don't have the money available to post with the court and the trial ends up getting canceled anyway. But there's the cases where they do get the money and they do deposit it um, and they do get their trial on that issue. And how long does that usually take to get that trial? I suppose it depends depending on the, the time of year and stuff, but are we talking a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month? It, it depends on the county. So there, there's in 504B, there's a statute that says the trial needs to occur within six days. Oh. Most courts, so if, if you wanted to push the issue, you could probably make them do it. The judges might get pissed at you because they've got to control their calendar as well. Right. So most of the time you kind of go along with the judge and the clerk because the judge will look at the clerk and say, when's my next trial date? And it might be 13 days. It might be eight days. You, have, you, you just don't know. It depends on how busy that, um, that county is with their trial schedule. Um, so, yeah, it's usually within a couple weeks that you would have the trial with respect to the property conditions. And then as a landlord and owner, now, now I mean, it, it's a mini trial in front of the judge. You've got to say, here's who my witnesses are. You get to do a witness list, exhibit list. You know, I, I put the landlord, the property manager on the witness stand. Is this the lease? What does it say? How much rent do they owe? Prove up the ledger, prove up the lease, get them into evidence. Um, and then you start going down the road of, were you given notice of the mice? What did you do? Who did you call? Did you call an exterminator? Did you go out? Did you put in traps? Did you take any photos? Those sorts of things. I would things. imagine a lot of people have this problem with bed bugs as well, you know, maybe more so than, than mice, right? Uh, particularly in multi-units. I, I, I had one where I went to where the owner had in their lease that if the central air unit uh, goes out, that they would not, it would be up to the tenant to repair or replace it. And the tenant argued that that was a habitability issue, and the judge actually favored on the side of the landlord said, you know what, central air is not habitability. Right, it's, it's, it's not a necessity. Right, right. Yeah. you do not need central air in your home to live. Right. So, and, but that was a tremendous pain in the rear, too. You know, it was, it was a couple well, well, to deal with it, right? And yep. so when it comes down to, you know, am I going to have to pay my lawyer 250 bucks an hour to go argue about mice and was I reasonable in ordering this exterminator or did I only have to go put out traps and shove steel wool in the right. pipe holes or, or whatever the case is. Uh, and I always tell, I, if I had my way with all of my property management clients, I would say if your technicians went into every house with a GoPro on their head so I could actually see the conditions of these properties, <laughs> right. it would be a huge benefit to your defense. You know, if, if there's garbage all over the floor and the trash can is overflowing and there's open bread and crumbs everywhere, it, it is a defense that you could say they were willful or negligent. And you will not believe how some of these people live, like some of these tenants. And it looks like me and my college roommates, you know, back in our 20s, we, right. we were one step away from living. I mean, we were living in our own filth. And, yeah. and, 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 then, and it's impossible for a landlord in that scenario. And you're right. I happen to have two GoPro cameras here. <laughs> uh, and, and that's a, it's, it's great advice. You know, send someone yeah. through. If the tenants are truly living in squalor, there's nothing you can do. Right. And, and a GoPro is an extreme example. I mean, it's like every technician has, like the idea, has a smartphone, right? right? Everyone has a camera on them. So just please, when you go in, get photographs of what's going on. Document how what, what because this is how you're going to defend yourself. I mean, you can only do so much and be part of the solution yeah. if they're not. Uh, I agree. I, I am, you know, people in our office, they're tired of hearing me talk about it. But, you know, it's, it's infinitely easier today to get photos than it is 10 years ago even, right? right? Because every camera has a seven megapixel or every phone has a seven megapixel camera on it. So, um, well, that's great. Uh, I, I don't know that we need to go. I don't think we need to scare anybody else. Well, right. <laughs> well, you know, and you had, you had brought up bed bugs and I, and I think right now, you know, the bed bug phenomenon is kind of like, um, Mice, in my opinion, the, the judges, mice used to be pests. Pests was mice, rats, those sorts of things. Right. Once in a while, we would see cockroaches in Minnesota, but not that often. And just recently, there's been more of these bed bugs, right? So the way I look at it is a landlord can take some actions to, hop, to, to help stop mice by, by the things I said, traps, plugging holes, uh, you know, spray foam in the insulation, steel yeah. wool, and th those sorts of things. But a landlord, there's nothing you can do if somebody buys 
a used sofa or if a kid has a sleepover and that little kid had bed bugs when they came over in his clothes and right. it spreads to your unit the reality is is that there's really no judge in Minnesota especially Hennepin County or in the metro area that's going to look at it and say it's not the landlord's responsibility to do something about it. We don't have the case law yet that looks at bed bugs as strictly a tenant cause problem. Well, even in single family homes, I've had them where it's a property that I purchased, had been vacant, I rehab, touched every surface in the place. There'd never been uh, any sighting of a bed bug or a cockroach. And then 12 months later, a tenant's in there and there's cockroaches and bed bugs and suddenly it's my problem. And, and that's the reality is, is that Starting out, you need to treat it as, as your problem. Use those GoPros and those cameras to document the conditions of what it looked like. And then, and then presumably, as a good landlord, you're going to have move-in and move-out photos of every single unit that you ever deal with. So that if, by chance, now you've got to spend $3,500 on a full house heat treatment and you want to seek... Uh, indemnification, if you will, or if you want, you add that to the tenant's bill because right. they caused it. The tenant's obviously going to argue, this isn't my deal. This is your job as the landlord, as part of the covenants of habitability, yeah, obviously. to get rid of the bed bugs. And your response is, this is a single family home. This didn't come from unit one or unit three or unit four next door because we didn't do something about it. This is a contained unit. You didn't have bed bugs for the first 10 months. This was a complete rehab remodel when you moved in. Here are the clean photos and here's what it looks like now when you live there i'd rather be def you know arguing your position with that evidence as to having no move-in photos no evidence right. of anything like this but again at the end of the day you need to solve the problem first and then and then fight the fight later well and they can't dictate the terms mm -hmm. on how you solve it either right they can't if i say i'm going to do a chemical treatment the tenant can't say no i demand you do a heat treatment no nope, right? they can do that right. there's actually a specific case out of uh, st cloud i remember that it's one it's called yeah. rush v westwood is the case where they said you know what kind of is a two-way street the tenant has some responsibility to help out you got to prep the unit you got to bag your all those sorts of things you got to be clean uh, and get ready for the treatment and you don't get to call the shots you don't get to say i, I want a three thousand dollar heat treatment as opposed to a twelve hundred dollar chemical treatment so right. they, they can't do that right very good. Uh, so this was um, the eviction hearing, mm -hmm. uh, part two of our three-part series. Anything else you want to add that we didn't talk about? You know, I, I guess the last kind of thing I would talk about is, uh, remember we talked about the tenant wanting to contest the eviction based on a Fritz conditions defense. Yes. Um, that's to a non-payment of rent case. That's when they would have to post their rent. If you were to bring an eviction for breach of lease, you know, too many loud parties, lots of complaints from the neighbors, those sorts of things. A breach of lease case, uh, if it's breach and non-payment of rent, the tenant doesn't have to post their rent. If, it's, if there's any claim of a breach of lease, they get their trial automatically, so they're not having to post their rent. So again, then, if you're going to breach, whether it's drug use and you have police reports and then you're getting into subpoenaing neighbors or police officers, that's a breach case. Um, and another common issue that you'll see as a landlord, getting back to the conditions, is a favorite play of the tenants nowadays is to call the city. You know, they're behind right, on the rent, right. so uh, uh, I'm going to call the city to come in and have an inspection. And even if the property just passed two months ago, it almost seems like the city has to send someone, right, because they, they can't ignore it. The city inspector comes out, and he just feels like he's got to write something up because he's there. Right. And you get a city correction order. So the tenants will show up at court. Well, the easiest thing for them to do is pull a smoke detector off or pull the battery. Right, right that or, or... Rip a handrail off. Handrail, yeah. Those are, you know, I know, this has happened Tear a screen, you know, yeah. whatever the case is. So at the end of the day, when the tenant shows up with a city correction right. order, I mean, that's not helpful as the landlord. So just be aware that that's a play tenants will make to try to gum up the process, buy themselves more time, et cetera. The good news is that pretty much every city correction order has a fix-it date or a deadline. Right. And as long as you fix it and repair it and get before and after photos, right, of, your, of what it looked like before and that you fixed it, that's what you bring to court and say, yeah, I understand there was a city order here, but we fixed it before we even got to court. I can generally predict when a tenant is going to be behind on rent by the, the sudden appearance of maintenance requests right. if we suddenly get four maintenance requests my first impulse is uh i bet you they either haven't paid rent this month or are planning not to pay rent right. next month and, and many times like we'll we we deal with those things very 
quickly, right? Yeah, when and we, and you and you should because you know that the sandbox you're playing in as I a landlord that. and a property manager is this is how you have to deal with yeah, it. Begin with the end in mind, and I know where that's Correct. going. So, yeah. well, awesome, Matt. This was a uh, really, really, really educational and informative. Uh, Matt Engel with the Engel Law Firm. Matt, if someone wants to get a hold of you, how do they get a hold of you? You can go to my website, theengelfirm.com. T H E E N G E L firm.com my new website in a couple of weeks is evictionminnesota.com so that'll be coming out make sure you check that out um, or give us a call uh, the number is 612-373-7060 awesome and i'm scott with verde property management this was part two of our three-part series of the eviction process the eviction hearing uh, when we come back after a short break we're going to talk about what happens post-eviction or the post-eviction process. We'll see you guys back here in a few minutes. Thank you.